Okay, here we go. We got Oakland legend Lil D, aka Daryl Reed, in the building. What's happening, man? It's my pleasure to do this interview. Absolutely, man. You know, someone who grew up in the Bay, um, Lil D is a name that I've always heard, you know, growing up. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that we're finally getting to sit down together after you've been incarcerated for so long. Thank you so much for coming in. I, pre I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So let's go ahead and start in the very beginning. So you grew up in East Oakland. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, this was, I guess, the, the early 80s, late 70s? Yes, the early, the early 80s, man. Yeah, the early 80s. Okay, so, so you grew up in a time where crack hadn't quite hit yet. Yes, absolutely. So describe to me what the environment was in Oakland before crack actually hit. Well, the environment in Oakland before the crack epidemic hit was, um, was the heroin dealers pretty much and um, powder cocaine dealers and weed, and weed dealers before crack hit maybe in like 84, somewhere around then. But um, I myself didn't start indulging in crack until 1986. Okay, so I mean, when you talk about, I mean, cocaine and heroin, but heroin in particular, that's really one of the worst drugs out there. You see people doing all types of really terrible things uh, for heroin. So, you know, were you seeing some of the you know, some of the fallout from heroin junkies and so forth when you were a kid? Yes, I was because um, my grandmother was staying in a 69th village. And at the time is when Felix Mitchell was the biggest drug, heroin drug kingpin at the time. And my mom's sister had a baby by Felix, which was Felix Wayne, which is my cousin. So at the time, Felix and them had a operation going on in, in Oakland. So I was exposed to that environment by spending a lot of time over at my grandmother's house in the projects because she used to babysit me a lot because my dad and mom both worked. So that's why people think that Felix is my blood uncle, but I always try to explain to people he's not my blood uncle. I just spent a lot of time around him because I used to be with my cousin, Little Wayne, and I was a little older than Little Wayne, so I kind of looked out for Little Wayne. So therefore, we spent a lot of time with Felix. So they would see us riding Rolls Royces and the limousines and all that. So the streets just took it upon themselves and started saying that Felix Mitchell was my uncle. Okay. So in actuality, he's not my uncle, and I've always tried to explain that, you know? Yeah, I mean, that was always the word was, okay, you know, Lil D was, was Felix's uncle, and, you know, that's why they were so close. But, you know, you guys were just very close. Yes. Okay, I'm glad we cleared that up. How old were you when Felix Mitchell kind of took you under his wing and started, you know, exposing you to that type of lifestyle, you know, and the Rolls Royces and the jewelry and giving you money and so forth? Like, man, 12 years old, you know, 12, 13 years old, man, and... um being in them Rolls Royces, man, and watching this fly guy with all these beautiful women, you know, he was like uh, he was like Robin Hood to us, you know? And, um, you know, he had a, a influence on me because seeing that young, you get caught up in the visual, you know? And even though my parents tried to keep me away from that and shelter me, it was kind of impossible because I was spending so much time in the projects and seeing that, and then some, some of my uncles was a part of the mob at the time, which was my grandmother's sons, and those were my blood uncles. Okay, you're talking about the Mob 6ix9ine? Yes. Okay, and, and how big of a crew was Mob 6ix9ine? It, 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 was no, it was no crew like the 69 Mob, though. Like, um, you know, a lot of these guys, now that you hear saying the Mob, they got that from, from Felix Mitchell, from the 69 Mob, and the family, which was Mickey Moore. That's where this mob talk come from. So now you got all these guys talking about they the mob, but they never really knew what that stood for. It was my other brother, you know? Mm. And that came from, from, from Felix and them during that time. And, you know, Felix and them used to watch um, 
the Untouchables and these different type of gangster movies with Al Capone and all them, and they took on this persona. You know, they um, you know, when they, when it was a problem and they jumped out their cars, they jumped out their cars, man, with machine guns. You know, it, it was for real though. So the older guys that I grew up around, you couldn't be soft growing up around these dudes because they was what you called real gangsters in the streets, you know? And so being around that at a young age and them explaining to me what the, what the rules was to the streets, I knew what the consequences were. And I knew that if you, if you jumped in the streets, that you had to be prepared for some of the violence and things that come with in the streets because now you got a lot of money involved, you know, at such a young age. Okay, so, so at that age, you're 12, 13 years old, what do you think was the worst amount of violence you actually witnessed yourself being around all that? Well, at that, at that age, they weren't going to allow me to see too much violence visually because of my age, and they were trying not to expose me to, to certain things, you know what I mean? But still, I got my ear open, and I can hear a certain conversation. And then the streets, the streets talk too, though. And the streets always talking and said that the 69th field, them was the guy that you didn't want to have no problems with. So that was already established, you know? Okay. And when you were like 12 or 13, how old was Felix Mitchell at that time? Um, man, Felix Mitchell was um, probably um, 20... Seven, twenty-eight, yeah, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. He was in his late twenties when I was at that age. Okay, so he was still a fairly young guy, you know, mid to late twenties, and he was controlling one of the biggest heroin empires. I mean, would you say on the West Coast? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, for yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Would you say he was one of the biggest in the whole in the whole United States at that point? I, at the, at that time. I would say, yeah, at that time. So, so here he was, you know, this huge figure, and, and he's he's taking you under his wing as his, his little homie. You mm -hmm. know, and, and you're you're still in you know junior high and high school during this time. Well, I guess junior yeah, high, still, yeah, junior high originally. I'm still I'm still going to school. Yeah, I'm still going to school. I got to go to school because my parents demanding that I go to school. You know. And I'm not, I'm not hustling at that time, though. I'm just around. I'm just around, and I'm, I'm doing small favors for them, whether it's running to the store or going to the mall to pick up something for them, and they putting money in my pocket. Simple, simple things I started out doing, you know? And then the simple things led to other things, you know? Okay. And, you know, and unlike a lot of the other guys who, who got into this life, you actually came from a two-parent uh, two home. Oh, for, and both of my parents was in my life. And exactly. both of them worked. They, they provided me and my little sisters with whatever we needed, you know. So I, I had the support of my parents. But like I said, the environment sucks you in sometimes, you know. You see your parents working, but they're struggling, you know. And, I, and I'm not understanding why they're working, but they're still struggling. And the reason why I knew they were struggling, because as a kid, you're listening to your parents have conversations. And it seemed like they living paycheck to paycheck. And, and I couldn't understand that as a young kid, you know? You start doing little runs and little favors for, for Felix. And at what point did it start to progress into, you know, kind of more serious things? Well, what eventually started happening is that I started holding guns because of my age. The, the chances that the police grabbing me and searching me was slim back then. So those are some of the little things that when we were young that we kind of started doing, making us be a part of what was going on around in our environment, you know? And then they would, you, would, you would earn a paycheck from that. They would, somebody might give you $100, you know, or they might give you $200, right? And when you're young, back then, that was, that was a cool little amount of money to have in your pocket, you know? And so this is how the, some of the younger kids like myself start even being a part of playing any role in what was going on around us back then. Okay. So here you are, you're a young kid, you're 13, 14 years old. 
you're starting to do these little runs for, you know, the dealers in your area that, that are under Felix. You know, obviously you, you start buying things for yourself. You probably start buying sneakers and nicer clothes and everything else like that, which I'm sure your parents start to notice because they're not buying the stuff for you. So, so how do the conversations at home start to kind of develop as your parents start to slowly figure out what's happening? That's interesting, right? I knew that was going to come up. So the first hustle that I had was scalping tickets at the Coliseum. I was this little kid, right? And I used to see these older guys selling these tickets, right? And they was fast talkers, right, and quick talkers. So I started asking some of these older guys, Man, how is y'all selling these tickets? So they explained to me what they was doing. So I said, well, if they can do this, I can do it. So what I started doing is I started approaching older people at the Coliseum, and I would walk up to you, and I would say, hey, sir, you, um, you happen to have any extra tickets? And you might say, yeah. And I might say, um, how much can I get a ticket for? I want to go in the game, sir. And here I am, this little nappy-headed kid, right? Sometimes them individuals would just give me a ticket thinking I'm sitting and going in the game. So what I would do is I would go around to the opposite side of the Coliseum, and then I go sell that ticket to another guy who's looking for a ticket. I'm putting that money in my pocket. So now I start scalping, and then once I start learning the trade, I would go and try to buy tickets for a lower value and then turn around and sell them and mark them up. And I started scalping. So what I started telling my parents was, when they asked me, where did you get these new outfits from, Daryl? I said, Mom, I went to the Raiders game and the Warriors game, and I made my money scalping tickets. And this worked for a, good, for a long period of time with them. But at some point, you know, it starts getting more serious for you. And yes. You know, I guess that you were actually being groomed as like a, a second in command in the whole operation, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, how did that start to happen? How did you go from just this little kid who's who's doing runs and holding guns and so forth to like, okay, this might be the next Felix Mitchell? So what happened was, as I got older and I got good at scalping tickets, I started making, you know, three, four hundred dollars as a little kid, right? <laughs> so at this recreation center that I used to hang out at called Rainbow on Seminary, they had this guy, guy there that was selling marijuana. And he approached me one day with an offer. He said to me, he said, man, would you be interested in investing with me into some um, weed? Man, I'm selling weed. I need a little help. Can you help me out? You want to invest into this marijuana? So I say to him, well, man, you know, what's going to be the split? And he said, man, we're going to go 50-50. Now, mind you, I'm a little kid. I'm, I'm 14 years old. So I give him the money to invest with him off into this marijuana. And he told me I didn't have to do nothing. He told me just front the money to him, and he's going to do all the hard work. So I say, man, this is, this is an offer I can't refuse. I gives him the money, he starts selling weed, he starts giving me a certain amount of profit throughout the week. So now my, my mind I get interested in what he's doing. So now I want, I want to ask him more questions on how much, how much you making out of this? How much you paying for this? And then once I learned what he was doing, I realized that he had been getting over on me because I was naive. So now this 14-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid, I told him I want to be more hands-on. When we purchase it, I want to be there, and I want to see how much we getting from my money I'm investing. And he didn't really like that because now I was gonna, he was going to realize that I know he's been, he been stealing from me. So what I chose to do is I, I started to go to my uncles and tell them this guy been beating me out of my money. But my uncles was dangerous, and if I don't went to my uncles, I don't know what would have happened. So I made a decision, and my decision was, no, nah, I'm making money. I don't want to run this guy off. He's beneficial to me. I'm just going to stay on top of the business side, and then I know how much money I'm, I'm bringing in, and he can't get over on me no more. That was my beginning of selling marijuana. 
So you're selling marijuana, and and marijuana is, you know, is a good business, but it's not on the level of a cocaine or a heroin. No, it's not on the level of cocaine or heroin. But back then, you got to remember, man, I was a little teenage kid. I was still in school, right? And the money that I started making at the time, at my age, was a lot of money back then because I I ended up putting together a crew. When I say crew, what I did was I would get some my partners who wanted to make some money, and I would give them hundred dollars worth of marijuana, and I tell them they can take twenty dollars and give me eighty dollars. So I have I have I had four or five of these guys on the block moving marijuana for me at that age, and then I was smart, so I I was stacking my money, I was saving my money and hiding it from my parents, because my parents told me that. I had to go to school. I better graduate. So I stuck to that. So I had to work that out where I can hustle and still go to school. So 14, 15, you were just doing marijuana? Yes. Okay. At what point did you graduate to, to cocaine and heroin? I never saw heroin a day in my life, okay. right? So what happened was I had a close friend of mine, and he approached me one day. And he said, hey, man, my mom just moved in this apartment building. And these people is up here selling these little white rocks, right? So I said, what is it? He said, they call it crack. I said, how much are they paying for it? He said, they paying $20 for these little rocks, right? So I said to him, um, what are you doing? And he said, man, I want to invest into it. Would you give me $160? I'm going to get a 16th of cocaine, one sixteenth, $160, right? At the time, I'm having money, so $160 to me is nothing. I, I give him $160. He goes up and he tells me it's going to move like this. The, he came back to me in a couple hours and told me it was gone. And I couldn't believe this, right? He said, man, you got to come up here and see this, man. I ain't never seen any people coming for this stuff, they're coming for these little rocks, man, the women, the men. So I came up here, which is right down the street from where I'm at now, and I saw these people lined up coming to get these little rocks. So I said, so I said to him, well, go ahead and keep doing it, man. Just go ahead and keep doing it, and we're going to build on it, right? So what happened is, within a month and a half, we started making so much money from these rocks, I didn't want to sell marijuana no more. So I went to the guys where I was selling marijuana, and now, and mind you, at the time, I was getting about five or seven thousand dollars a day in nickel bags of weed. Like that's a lot of weed back then, in nickel bags a day for a young kid, right? I told them guys, y'all can have that, y'all can have that weed over there, because when I seen what was happening with them rocks. Because I love math. I was doing numbers in my head. I said, I'm going to be a millionaire. So I gave him the weed turf and focused strictly on MacArthur Boulevard, right here where I'm at right now, in an apartment building about five blocks from here. And when the next thing you know, I was getting $10,000, $15,000 a day selling rock cocaine, and I'm in high school. So that was when I first got involved in selling rocks, right? And it grew, and it grew from there. But a lot of people think that Felix gave me something and put me in a position. I put myself in that position from a 16th of cocaine back then, you know? And at the time I was young, I, didn't, I never thought about what it was doing in my community, you know what I mean? Because I was a young kid, you know? And I just thought I was doing what everybody else was doing, trying to find a better way to change my, my life and change my family life, you know? And I didn't realize at the time that I was doing more harm to my community, you know? It's a, a lot of young guys at the time, they weren't thinking about that, man. We, we was just trying to find a way to get us some money, man, you know? Up until the point that, that you was doing weed, you know, we're, we're still selling weed. You know, I mean, it was, it's still an illegal operation, and you had a big operation with a lot of different people. You know, were the police or the feds coming in and busting any of these guys, or you, or were you kind of staying under the radar during that time? At the time, it wasn't a lot of violence 
involved with selling weed, you know. And for the most part, when there ain't a lot of violence involved with that type of activity, police is not really going. It's not going to be a problem unless you you bring attention to yourself or what you're doing. And what I was doing at the at time is being cautious about what I was doing and how I was going about doing it, you know. But once I got to a, a certain point in my hustling, you know, the streets is going to take the police what you're doing anyway. So they became aware that I was a marijuana dealer, you know. And, and some of the police officers didn't approach me about being a marijuana dealer, but of course I'm going to deny it and tell them I don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, the streets then already told to him, this is the guy with all the marijuana up here on, on, on seminary in Elizabethan Seminary in East 14. And, and when you talk about doing that much, you know, selling that much marijuana, uh, how are you sourcing all this stuff? You know, because obviously you weren't growing it all yourself. Well, back then, man, you know, the Jamaicans was running things, man. The Jamaicans had that good tie stick and that good endo back then, man. It wasn't all these exotic um, strands they got now. You know, back then it was kind of simple, you know. It was like, give me some of that good tie stick or give me some of that sticky endo, you know. And so back then the Jamaicans kind of was the ones who really had the good weed back then, you know. And I, and I was a slick talker, man. So I knew how to, I knew how to negotiate at a young age. Okay, and you yourself were not smoking weed at all. A couple of times it gave me a headache. And um, one of my aunties told my mama she seen me smoking weed. And my mama confronted me, and I never forget this. My mama confronted me, and she like, yeah, um, I heard you um, was smoking some weed, you know? And I tried not to lie to my mama as much as, as I could back then. And so I said, I said yeah, I, I smoked a little weed. And she asked me, how did it make you feel? I said, Gave me like a headache after the fact. She said, well, you know, smoking weed, you smoking weed today, tomorrow you might want to try some cocaine. I said, no, nah, I ain't gonna try no cocaine. Make a long story short. From that day she confronted me about that weed, I never picked up no weed from that day once. She asked me why I was doing it. I said, I was just doing it because the fellas was doing it. And I, at, at that point, I never picked up, I've never smoked no weed from that point when my mama confronted me. Smart, very smart. Not getting high from your own supply. <laughs> okay, so then it switches over to cocaine. And what year was this? It was like 1979, no, 1980? No, 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 86. Like 86. 80, 86. 80, yeah, 86. 86 is when I started dabbing into the, to the cocaine. See, because remember, a lot of people thought I was older than what I was because I had all these guys that was older than me and bigger than me following behind me. So they always thought I was the older guy, but I was the younger one. Were you considering yourself, were you, were you 69 Mob yourself or did you have your own thing going? I had my own thing going because I, I wanted my own identity. Now, of course I was associated with a 69 Mob because that's who I grew up up under. But I always wanted to make my own identity and I, and I wanted to operate differently from my older partners though, because I watched some of the mistakes they made, you know? A lot of them used the drugs, but back then it was a cool thing to do, you know? Them and their girlfriends, they snorted powder, they snorted powder back then. Or they put cocaine in cigarettes and weed. They called them blasters or cavies back then. And to them, that was just a part of the life, you know? You're hustling in the streets, they going to the clubs, they getting money. You know, we having a good time. So I watched that at a young age and I used to listen to their conversations and I used to say, man, these dudes messing off all their money though, you know? So I said, I'm gonna stay away from them things so I can have a clear mind and I know what's going on around me, you know? And I was observing these dudes at a very young age, paying attention to their conversations and how they carry themselves. So I always said that for those reasons, I wasn't, I didn't want to use drugs or I didn't want to drink, you know? So, so before, before you switched over into, into crack, in 1980, uh, the 69 mob went to war with uh, another crew called the family. Mickey Moore. Mickey Moore, exactly. So you, you actually saw this and, and saw the, 
you know, the effect of all this? Yeah, well, well, remember, back then we were so young, so we had, at nighttime, we couldn't be outside in the projects. We couldn't go to certain areas because it was a drug war going on. So as kids, they tried to protect us by making sure we wasn't out at night, that we wasn't in certain areas because they didn't want no harm to come to us at such a young age. Okay, and, and Felix Mitchell, he actually aligned himself uh, with the Black Panthers. No, that, he, he didn't align himself with no. the Black Panthers. That, that story right there is not true. Really, the Black Panthers, they really they didn't want Felix and them doing the harm to the community that they was doing, which was uh, their run. So the Black Panthers, again, at the time, they really tried to approach Felix and them and extort them. But Felix and my older partners that grew up in the 69 village is not nobody you want to try to extort. You know, okay. you, you do your history with them. You know, them guys are some of the most ruthless guys that, that you want to know coming from the streets. So when, when, I, when I came, became who I was, I didn't have to use no violence or nothing like that anyway because they already respected me from what my older homeboys had already done laid down, you know? Got it. Got it. Okay, so then 1985, Felix Mitchell goes to prison. Yeah, he goes, he gets convicted. They give him life without. He the first one they get a life, life without for the CCE2. And he know he going he, he gonna to die in jail, you know? <laughs> Right. So so he goes to prison. And what, what was the effect in Oakland when suddenly you have the head of this huge drug empire get, gets you know, taken off the streets? Um, sort of um, people fighting for territory, you know, fighting for that territory, man, because back then, Heron was a lucrative was a lucrative business, you know? It was a lucrative business, you know? And then how long after he gets locked up does he actually get killed in prison? Well, the true story with that with Felix is that it was a, one of these guys that he was pretty cool with in prison that had got a debt. And um, the guy didn't pay his debt. This guy used to hang around on Felix. And the guy who he owed the money to wanted his little money, uh, a small amount of money, because in prison, a small amount of money gets you hurt, you know? And so what happened is Felix had never been to prison before, so he didn't really know the prison politics. He wasn't too sharp with the prison politics, you know? So Felix got killed on a fluke back then. That wasn't really meant for him. It's just that he was dealing with one of the guys who had the debt, and when the guys, when the guys were upset about their money, they knew how much power Felix had, so they felt that if, if we move on Felix, we can kill the head, so that's what ended up kind of happening with that situation. Felix got killed on, on the fluke back then, man. He, should, he shouldn't have never died about something like that back then, you know? Okay. And I guess his funeral was, was on another level. Uh, <laughs> he had, like, horses, you know, you know, pulling his casket, and it was, like, 14 Rolls Royce limousines. It was, like, you know, like the president of, of, of America got killed or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, that was, um, you for know, a young kid, man, that was a sight to see, man, to see um, this guy from the streets, man, to be carried in a carriage with these horses, man, in his casket, man, with all these Rolls Royces. But if you knew Fle Felix, man, they called him Felix the Cat, right? Because he was, he, he was suave, he was fly, right? He wouldn't have wanted it no other way, man, than, than, than to go out in that way because he knew that People was going to be talking about this funeral for many years, you know, and still to this day, people talk about Felix Mitchell's funeral, you know, and I was a young kid, you know, and um, I know that Felix, um, you know, did what he did, but at the end of the day, you know, I got love for Felix, you know, because um, that was my cousin's father. He was good to me. Um, he used to take me to the Fila shop when I was a little kid, you know. Back then, Fila's was real expensive, man, right? 
and he would take me and Lil Wayne into the feed lot shop and just tell, tell the people in there and whatever they want, give it to them, you know? And all the kids would see us in the East West suits and we'd be smiling, we knew we was fly. So he exposed me to these things, man, and he, and he was a, uh, 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 his 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 dressing was was some dress, the way he dressed up. I never seen nobody as fly as this guy, you know. So he inspired me to wanna, he inspired me to wanna be fly, you know. And so, um, you know, a lot of people demise of him because of the things he did, and you know. But for me, it was some good sides to Felix too, you know. Things he he taught me too, you know. So I'll always have respect for, for, for dude, you know, and um and I love for Felix, you know, because he inspired me, man, to try to be the best I can be at whatever I wanted to do in my life, you know. Okay. And and, and did the debt, you know, well, with with Felix getting pulled off the streets and then ultimately getting killed, did that kind of open the window, you know, for your organization, which I guess at one point was LDI, Little D Incorporated? Yeah, so um, what's the trip, man, is that um, at such a young age, I never thought that the responsibilities that fell on my shoulder would happen while still in high school. And when it came to me, I accepted it, you know. But I was my own man, though. What I mean by my own man is, is that when Felix was in the county jail before he got sentenced, he, he sent me a message and said he wanted to talk to me. And so I went up here to talk to Felix, you know. And the reason I wanted to talk to Felix was because my older homeboys, they didn't like what I was doing out here in the streets. And what they didn't like was that I was building relationships with guys from different neighborhoods that my older partner homeboys was not getting along with, where they didn't have wars with, right? So they was reporting to Felix, telling Felix, you need to talk to D, because D out here dealing with these guys in West Oakland and Richmond, and you know, we don't deal with them dudes, man, and you need to talk to him, he getting big-headed. Now mind you, man, I'm a teenager. I go to the county jail, and go see Felix face to face. And he says to me, he say, hey man, um, I've been hearing you've been hanging out in the Acorns and that West Oakland, man, you know that's dangerous, man. You know, we don't get along with them dudes down there. And I listened to him, because I respect the dude, you know, I let him talk. And I said to him, well man, let me tell you my side, you know. I said, man, I respect you and my older homeboys, and I always respected what y'all did, but I got a different philosophy. And I said, well, my philosophy is, I don't want all that violence that I seen going on with y'all and y'all crew. I just want to get some money, man. So if me and these guys build alliances and problems come up, we can have conversations before it leads to violence. I said, I feel comfortable going in the Acorns in Richmond because I didn't build a relationship with these dudes. They're not going to let nothing happen to me, right? I said, and the more relationship that I build with these guys, it's going to be less violence and we're going to all get more money because we don't have to be worrying about looking over our shoulders or we can't go in this neighborhood or in that neighborhood. So after this conversation with Felix, he said to me, he said, well, look, man, I'm going to jail for the rest of my life. You know, you out here, you done made a, a choice of getting in the streets. I always told you what the consequences were. So if that's what you want to do, man, I just want you to be careful, but you got my blessings. And I said, I, I appreciate that. So he sent word to some of my other older homeboys who was in the mob and told him that's what he want to do. Let him, let him do what he, what he do. And he, he, he gave me his blessings. Okay. So, so you started selling crack at, was it 16? No, I was like, um, yeah, about, about 16. Yeah, about 16. Yeah, about 16. And when I was in high school, going to Fremont High. Okay. 
And by 18 years old, you had stacked millions of dollars. I'm by 18 years old, I was a millionaire. Okay. And this was by, you know, running an organization where, you know, you prevented wars between the different neighborhoods. And also, I guess you, you kind of initiated a practice where, you know, the, the addicts wouldn't get ripped off and so forth. You know, you I, ran it I, I more also, corporate than, also than the guys before you. I stressed it to the guys that worked for me and that was hustling in the streets to not be mistreating the people who come and buy the, the, the drugs from you because I watched them get taken advantage of by certain individuals who was in position of power. So I stressed it to the guys that I was dealing with, don't mistreat, don't mistreat these people. That could be your auntie or your uncle. And the, them people love me still today for being that kind, even though I was doing wrong. But I still demanded that the guys who was dealing with them don't take advantage of them in that situation, you know? Okay. So, I mean, you're talking about millions of dollars that, that you're saving. So you're talking about kilos and kilos and kilos of cocaine running through your organization. Um, could you say where all this cocaine was coming from? No, I, I couldn't say that. I couldn't say that, and I wouldn't say that, though, because what I would never do is, is um, even when I share my story, I'll never jeopardize somebody's freedom or um, exposing somebody about my lifestyle because I, it's a lot of guys, they're not comfortable with ever doing an interview or doing a book, but with me, the reason I'm comfortable with it is because I know that I've never crossed nobody. I would never cross nobody. And when they gave me 35 years, I had the opportunity to go home and I made it clear to the FBI, man, that nobody forced me to do what I was doing. Whatever I'm sitting get, I'm sitting taking on the chin by myself. Okay, and what was interesting about you, I mean, because you talk about how Felix Mitchell was like the flyest, flashiest dude you've ever met. But you were actually low key. Well, I was low key until I didn't listen to my juvenile attorney, right? I had caught a little case and I had a juvenile attorney and I'll never forget talking to her. Her name was Linda Ryback, right? She said to me, she said, um, you know, don't you start buying no new cars and stuff. You know, that's what she told me, right? She talked to me like I was a son. And I said, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to just buy me some old school cars, you know? So I'm going to tell you what happened one time. So one, one day I was on Foothill MacArthur and I was um, speeding down Foothill in a Maserati convertible, right? And I got a ticket, you know? So I had to get at my attorney about this ticket. Hey, I, I, I got a ticket. I need you to take care of this ticket, right? And she seen this car I was in, you know? And she said to me, she said, Daryl, um, who, who car is this? You got this ticket in. And I said, it's mine. And she said, didn't I tell you, don't start buying them cars because you start buying them cars, you're going to bring too much attention to you, you know? And my, intent, my intentions was not to start buying new cars, though, you know? But I started having all this money, you know? And I wanted to sell, I wanted to be different from from these other guys, you know. They had you know they had Mercedes Benz and these other type of cars. I just wanted to be different, you know, from everybody, man. And so you know I went. My old partner took me over on Van Ness in San Francisco to this exotic car car dealership, and we started looking at these cars. And I seen this little pretty red car with a blue top, and I was like, man, what is that? And they was like a Maserati, a Maserati. And I said, man, I want that. And then the guy looking at me, right, because he know I'm young, and he kind of looking at me like, this, this little dude this is crazy, right? But I had one of my guys with me that would, would go help make the purchase of these cars. And so the guy asked me, how much you, you want to put down on it? And I said, man, I'm, I'm cashing this out. And he looks at the other, um, other partner, my other partner looks at him and say, so make a long story short, that same day, I, 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 I told one of my guys to go get, go get the money, and, and I bought that Maserati that day, you know? 
And then after I bought the Maserati, now I, I, want, I want all these other kind of exotic cars, you know? And, and, and so mind you, I'm 18 years old, you know? But I'm, I'm not realizing that when I'm starting buying these cars, the attention that I'm getting in the streets is, is stuff is gonna get back to the authorities, you know? So at that point, now they starting to say, we got to start really looking at this guy. He got to be having a lot of money to be mining these cars that he's buying. And before I got out of high school in the 12th grade, one of these officers told one of my aunties that we know what your nephew out here doing, but we're going to wait until he get out of high school, you know? But we're going to get him. You know, this was before I graduated in 1986, you know? And lo and behold, they had already started watching me. The FBI and them had already started watching me in high school, man. And you know, that's kind of unheard of though, you know, but, but I'm young and naive to that. I'm, I'm like, I'm not paying no attention to that, man. There's other guys out here hustling and getting money though, but they felt I was a threat, man, at that young age, having them organizational skills they felt like I was a threat, man, and they wanted, they wanted to make an example out of me. You know, I was just young and naive at the time, you know. Okay. And, and I know that you were dealing with guys in L.A. during this time as well. Um, you know, and I've had Freeway Ricky Ross on my show a couple of times. <laughs> were you working with him at all during that time or no? No, no. That, that, <clears throat> that's my partner, though. Ricky Ross is my partner, man. Um, yeah, they was killing it in... Uh... I remember. <laughs> I remember when we first met, when I got in the car. And okay. I think we were riding in a van. Somebody picked us up in a van, and, and he was in the car, and they was like, man, this is such and such and such and such. He's from Oakland, and uh, I'd heard of his uncle already. You know, it wasn't actually his uncle. Okay. Felix Mitchell. We talked about that in the interview. Everyone thought, everyone kind of assumed and ran with that story. Yeah. But technically, it wasn't, it wasn't his uncle. It was someone that took him under his wing. Okay, okay. But it wasn't actually, Felix Mitchell wasn't actually his uncle. <clears throat> All right. Well, I was always under the impression yeah. that. Every, everyone was. <laughs> the end of that was his uncle. And, yeah. And um, I had never heard of D. So when we met that day, it was like, um, all right, cool. <laughs> Did you... Do you remember any of the conversations you guys had? Was there anything that you kind of tried to impart on them? Nah, not really. Not really. Uh uh I can't remember. We we got we got tighter in jail. Ah, okay. When we were in jail together, we got tighter than uh than we were on the street. You know, uh, on the street it was more of a customer uh, uh, buyer seller relationship. Were you actually supplying to them? I have, yeah. And Rick was had his sons playing tennis, these little kids playing tennis, you know, and I was like, it's interesting. I ain't never seen no little black kids playing tennis. And it was Ricky, Ricky Ross, little kids playing tennis, right? Because even back then, he, he knew Serena and Venus now because he was in a tennis circuit, you know? So I met this guy, Freeway Rick, right? When I met him, he was in his old station wagon, you know? And he was dressed like a bum. But they told me that this was his M.O., you know, he would look like a bum, but he'd get money, right? So I met him. He said, man, how old is you? And I told him, and he said, and, um, who, who, you, who you down here? Who sent you down here to do business? I said, man, this is, I'm, I'm doing the business, you know? And he said, wow, you know? So that's, like, that's how I met Freeway is I was looking in for some work and um, I knew that the type of money he was getting, he would be able to, you know, supply me, you know. And when I told him how much I wanted, he thought it was for somebody else. And I told him, no, nah, this is for me, man. So that's how I met Freeway before I went to prison. So we already knew each other. So that's why we, um, it's cool, me and Freeway Rick. And like I said, I've interviewed Freeway Ricky Ross a couple of times, and he told me, you know, he, he did his time. So he told me about his whole operation and how it tied into the Iran-Contra thing and so forth. You know, when you look at the size of Freeway Ricky's operation and your operation, how would you compare the two? Well, you know, what I'm going to say this what separates me from the guys like Freeway Rick and a lot of these other guys who had a run 
and who made a lot of money. All these guys was much older than me, right? None of them guys did what I did at my age. Um, and even though they might have been in the game hustling for many years, I achieved what I did within a three or three and a half year period of time and, and a teenager in high school going to school. So my story, I can easily separate my story from these guys that we're talking about, though these guys, all these guys are much older than me, right? And I did what I did in s such a short period of time. And not only did I do that, I had the ability to build all these alliances with these different neighborhoods who would normally be at war with each other. And, and those relationships that I built when I was a teenager way back then, those relationships are still validated today, 28 years after I came out of prison, these same relationships. N none of these guys who then been in the game hustling has done what I've been able to do far as with my diplomacy and my ability to get all these different guys in one room and to be able to get along, you know? And um, I know a lot of guys have uh, end up having more money than me. They was in the game for many years, much older than me. But then none of them do what I did at such a young age in a short period of time. And, and those are facts. Well, at one, at one point, you were known as the crack king of Oakland. Uh -huh, yes, uh-huh. Now, at that, at that age, 18, 19, 20 years old, when, when you, know, you were doing this, did you, have, you know, did you ever sit back and say, man, I, I'm making millions of dollars, but I can't ignore the fact that I'm destroying these communities? You, know, you have these mothers and grandmothers and children and these crack babies and, you know, these neighborhoods when I was a kid, you know, when you were a kid were nice neighborhoods, suddenly were just war torn, yeah. you know, and along with the crack, you know, even though your personal operation may not have been violent, but crack brought an incredible amount of violence. You know, for example, you know, when I interviewed Big U, you know, who's affiliated with the role in 60s, yeah, he about said the one thing that, uh -huh. you know, he, he said the one thing that he, they, he noticed that when he got out of prison and saw crack hit LA, that the weapons started to change. So when it, when it actually hit was like 83, and I came back home 84, and we went from being able to just, and it, it, it changed it because two things happened major. The, uh, um, the influx of guns and the different kind of guns, and then- Like the automatics. The, the automatics, because yeah. we hadn't even seen automatics. We weren't even having no automatics then. And especially like, what the the um, most the, we was we was inflamed by the nine millimeter from the movie that came from New York was um, King of New York mm. when um, Lawrence Fishburne had the nine millimeters in the King of New York we was like oh that <laughs> what the you know what I mean because we come from the Clint Eastwood era the the pistols and the four five and the magnums so when crack came all the different movies came that influenced the culture at the same time. With the weapons changing, the murder rates are happening, along with the, the drug addiction and the communities being destroyed. You know, you, you saw all this. So did you start to think about it, any of that during that time? I, 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 didn't, I wasn't thinking about that at the time, because again, when, when you young and you getting money, you chasing the money. You, you know, you, uh, you, you're not thinking about those things though, you oblivious to those things though, because in your head, you feeling like, man, all I'm doing is doing what I gotta do to try to try to get out, get out the neighborhood, you know? But at the same time, like I told to you, you still damaging the neighborhood. And, and even from back then, the long-term effects happened because it had an effect on the people who was using the drugs, you know? Which didn't allow them to be the best parents they can be. So all those things happened from that era, you know? But just like that era you talking about about crack, prescription drugs that's legal, guess what they doing? 
They ruining, they ruining more nine to five people than heroin, cocaine, or any drugs that's ever. And guess what? That's legal. Yeah. Them, them, them pharmaceutical companies is drug dealers, man. You know, they drug dealers. You, 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 can, you, can, you can shape it how, how you want to shape it. But they putting people on heroin, man, for pain. So I mean, yeah, I so so let's 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 question let's question what what they drugs have an effect on society is doing too. At twenty years old, you're at the height of of your drug empire, and you decide to throw this giant birthday party. Yeah, uh, at the turf club. Okay, and I guess three thousand people showed up. Yeah, I, I I didn't expect I didn't know that was going to happen. I mean, I knew people was going to show up, but I don't even think the people who came to the party expected for that to happen. Okay. And I guess MC Hammer performed? MC Hammer performed. This was right before he came out. And um, soon after, like I say, after that party, 10 days later, I was arrested, but I was already under investigation. But the beauty of that Hammer performing at that party 30 years ago is he just performed again for my birthday party on December the 1st, 2018. Hammer performed again for my people at my birthday party to celebrate my 50th birthday party. How beautiful is that? Yeah, well, in fact, I mean, I even knew that you were getting out because Hammer, I think he either tweeted me or he he texted me or something like that oh, oh, and it was like oh, oh, Lil, oh Lil D getting oh, out. Hammer. okay and we'll and we'll talk about that later on you know, right. as we get to that part of the story <laughs> but yeah hammer was the person who kind of pulled my coat to, that's to why me, i love him you know that's why i love yeah. dude yeah and and during that time i mean you know you're talking about at the height and being the crack king of oakland you were dealing with all the, the Bay Area celebrities and so forth. You knew Too Short back then as well, right? Of course, yeah. I, I, I was, um, nobody bought more special request tapes from Too Short than Lil D. You know, he'll tell you that, right, you yeah. know. And then it became popular. And then you had all these other guys from these other neighborhoods. They wanted a special request too now with their name in it, you know. And so I embraced Short back before he became, you know, popular or a national artist. I embraced him in his early stages, you know, and um, people would ride around with these special requests and, you know, I got the music system in there and they, he rapping about my name and what I'm doing and, you know, had me feeling like I was somebody. Yeah, no, I, I haven't been uh, interviewing Too Short for years and, and he actually went into that whole story about how, you know, that's how he got you know, really got in the game was that he would go to all the major drug dealers and make these special requests, you know, special mixtapes. I would take down what block we were on, who was it, you know what I'm saying, they wanted the tapes, and they would order, they'd be asking for a specific little, man, I want that one when y'all said such and such. So I have a little, little, little notepad, and then we started adding to the pitch that, hey, well, you know, for 20, these cost $5, but you know, for 20, you like a baller, like you like you know, like a boss motherfucker for twenty, we'll make you a tape about you. That twenty dollars is like, you know, nineteen eighty two. Motherfuckers is, ain't really like just coming up off twenties on like some old rap shit. You really had to have some pocket change. So not a lot a lot of not a lot of lower level motherfuckers was coming up off the twenty. It was really a boss situation. So it's, it's right. people it's people like yourself, but you were, I guess, the king of the special request tapes from Too Short, huh? Oh, for sure. And, and you know, he he said that on stage on a couple of occasions. You know, like when it comes to special yeah. requests, man, I just spent a whole lot of money on those special requests. I would buy I would buy extra tapes and pass them out to people, right? But what they didn't know is I wanted them to be playing that music with my name in it. Yeah, that was a great marketing. That was a great marketing idea back then. Yep, and I guess uh, you and Gary Payton uh, was another person who you kind yeah, of yeah, man. Uh, Gary, Gary Payton, man. I mean, Gary Payton met was we played a basketball game against each other. You know, I used to play basketball in in in, in school, but I was short, man. I knew I wasn't gonna grow right. So at some point, I'm like, I got to give up this basketball career, man. These dudes, all these dudes, getting too tall, right? 
So we played against Gary in junior high, and, I, and we beat Gary. And Gary scored about 30-something points on us, you know, because Gary was already good, you know. He, was, he had great skills. And I think I scored about 25, 26 points, you know. I was competing against this dude, you know. Wasn't bad for a little short guy, right? But this dude, Gary, was talking on, he was talking on his smack during the game, you know. He was, I mean, he was talking smack, right? So I said to Gary, I said, hey, man, and I say, man, look, man, you ain't going to you ain't gonna be talking slick to me like that, man. You keep on talking slick to me like that, man. I'm going to take this somewhere else, you know. And, you know, he, 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 he ain't, he ain't want to, you know, get any, you know, he ain't want to hear that part. Make a long story short, we became cool from that encounter we had. And even when he went to college, I would let him drive my cars, you know, so he can show them off to the girls. You know, he up in these new cars. You know how them girls in college, you see this guy in his new car, they think he's somebody, you know, and we got real close, spent time with him. You know, he came to prison, visited me a few times, and throughout the years, he supported me throughout the years and was there for my little son, which I appreciate. So these guys, I built relationships with them guys before I made it, you know, and even when I was getting money, I still did a little thing for these dudes who weren't in a financial position and, and, and was willing to share with them. And that's why some of these guys looked out for me when I was in prison for all those years. And some of them looked out for me when I returned from after all those years, you know. So I had real genuine relationships with these particular guys. They just all became somebody, whether it was a rap artist or a basketball player. So that's where those relationships come from, they genuine relationships. Okay, so here you are, you're 20 years old. And I guess your girlfriend is pregnant, right, about to, about to give birth. And... The FBI have been slowly building their case against you and using wiretaps and everything else like that. Uh -huh. Like how long, how long, you know, like how long was the FBI actually building its case against you? How many years total? What they, they, they claimed they was building a case over a two, a two year period of time, you know? But I think it might have been maybe a little longer. It might have been three years, but they say it was like for, for, for two years, you know, that they was building this case up on me, you know? Okay. And at, at 20 years old, what, what year was this? Um, 1988. I got arrested December 19... the 8th, 1988. I graduated from Fremont okay. High in 1986. Okay. And 1988... You know, you you didn't really. I mean, you had cell phones, but not not like today. Oh, yeah, you I, had the brick phone. I had phone, the Motorola 1500 brick phone. You had the Motorola yeah. 1500 brick phone. Then I had the big phone. It was like a suitcase with a strap on it, yeah. and, and it weighed like um, yep. 15 pounds. And then you you know you pick you take it up over there and you high side with it. See, I had I, I was one of the ones that was young and had nothing phones. I had multiple phones then, but I had an old school beeper. Yeah. So were the police actually wiretapping these these cell phones of yours? No. The the the, the what's interesting about me with the, with the FBI and the OPD back then, they said this little guy is smart, right? He won't talk on the phones. We can't get no wiretap on him. We got to figure out a way to get some evidence on him where we can give him a case. So this is what they did. They did surveillance on me at these different locations. And it was this one particular apartment complex where I got arrested at. They sent a technician up in there, and they put some cameras up in an exit sign like that so that they can see who was coming in and out of this apartment so they can attach the apartment to me where it was cooking going on at the time. So they had this camera there for over a period of time, and then once they felt they had enough to go in there and try to catch me in there at a time with some narcotics, that's what they did, and that's how I got arrested. But they said they had to go to the extreme to be able to get some on me because I was real crafty on how I moved around, you know?
right after this this huge party that you threw on your 20th birthday, the D the DEA actually raided your home. Uh, my apartment. My apartment by, by apartment. Lake Merritt off Van Buren. And, I mean, according to reports, they, they seized $3 million worth of cocaine and crack. Now, you, Is that true at all? Now, you know them people exaggerating. They exaggerate, man. They, um, they seized, um, like, 14 kilos of crack, 7 kilos of powder, and um, I think it was about, um, it was a little money in there. I think it was about 60-something thousand dollars in there. And then at the, but at the time, they said that was the biggest crack cocaine seizure ever, which it was at the time. But, but I, I was saying, man, there's nothing but 14 kilos, you know. That was what I was saying. Okay. But in their minds, they like, man, you know, you know how much crack cocaine is it is, you know. But again, okay. that's being young and naive, you know. I mean, you know, what they seized in your home at that point, what was the street value of that if you were just to estimate it off the top of your head? Um, man, you know, for, for me, what I'm going to do with it, maybe 350000 or something like that, or a little money, they going they said $3 million, man. It, it, it wasn't worth no $3 million. It ain't worth no $3 million. And them, that's exaggeration to justify what they're going to do to you in the courthouse, man. Okay. Because I guess, you know, there's an article in the LA Times that said that there are wiretaps, you know, um, in the Henderson case, you know, saying that he was, you know, that you guys are buying multi-kilo quantities of cocaine from Henderson and so forth. And, and Henderson was who? Big Rudy. Rudolph Henderson. You've you been, you, okay. you been doing your homework, huh, man? Yeah. This is what I do. You've been doing your homework. Yeah. This is what I do. But yeah, um... I started dealing with him through one of my other partners from North of Oakland originally, you know? And, um, but I started doing so much business with Rudy that my partner that was in the middle, he said, man, I, I gotta just, that are you direct me in to do, man. You taking up too much of my time, man. You moving too much cocaine, man. And he said, man, I'm just gonna put you with him because I'm spending too much time on your business, man. You, you, you getting a lot of money. So I, that's how I started doing business with, with, with Rudolph. Okay, so basically, so Henderson became your plug. One, one, one of them, one, one of them, yeah, one of them. And that's what was in the wiretaps. Before that DEA raid of your apartment where they, they seized all the cocaine, did you have any arrests or any jail time or prison time before then? I, 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 I called a case when I was juvenile for, for Mr. Meaner though, you know, I, I never, when did no time and then like that, that it was minor for, for for some for some activity when I was a juvenile. You know, I got caught, I got caught with a gun, I got caught with a gun in a barber shop. You know, and um, so I was on probation for that when I got arrested. But at the time, I had to have a gun on me at, at the time. I, I didn't have no choice then. Okay, so basically, you had, I mean, a relatively light record. And suddenly you have this raid where, I mean, it's not millions of dollars of cocaine, but it's still hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cocaine and crack. And, you know, this was during the whole, I mean, I guess Reagan, you know, Reagan era war on drugs time where they start changing the laws and so forth. Yeah, well, they, they was going to. Um... They was gonna make an example out of me though. I didn't have no bad record. And like I said, I hadn't had a gun on me at the time because there was a lot of violence going on in Oakland. And for a, a guy like me, I was kind of I still was a target because you're dealing with a lot of money. And um I would never leave the house at the time without having no gun on me, you know. So that's how I ended up getting caught with a gun in the barbershop, because when I went to the barbershop, when we got our haircuts, we had to have guns in our laps sitting in the barbershop. And people don't know that's how we had to live, you know? They think it's just all, all peaches and creams because you, you're hustling and getting money. But like I said, when you're dealing with money and cash and people know you got cash, that means you're a target, you know what I mean? Well, right, because, I mean, with the drug dealer culture came the robber culture, you know, the guys that would rob the drug dealers. You know, did you have to deal with any of that yourself with people trying to rob you or kidnap you and so forth? No, I ain't, I ain't, ain't nobody ever tried to rob me, you know. But I done had guys, a couple of guys called, they said, um, 
trying to extort me, but 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 not in an aggressive way, in a, with finesse. But you know, you know, the rumor is, don't, don't try to extort that little guy right there. You know, he he got, he got big nuts. So you know, that carry weight on the streets though. Like, you know, just let him be fair. But don't try to take nothing from him and don't try to extort him. So I ain't never had none of them problems, man. My, my reputation exceeds that. Okay. Were there any dirty cops, though, along the way? Because a dirty cop looks towards I've, you I've never, a lot easier. I've never dealt with no dirty cops or no nothing like that. I've only had cops when I was younger to approach me and say, hey, man. You a smart young guy. You 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 need to do something with your life. We know you got some, we know you got some money. You don't need the money. You need to get out, or you going to jail, man. They 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 watching you, man. They they coming to get you, man. And of course, you know this is what we normally do. Oh man, hey man, I ain't, I don't know what they talking about. So I've had those okay. situations, but I ain't know I ain't never had no dirty cops where they on no payroll or no none. Of, I ain't never dealt with, had no, no, no type of dealings like that, never. No, never. You know, before you got busted, was there ever a time where you said, look, man, I am 19, 20 years old. I'm sitting on millions of dollars in cash. I, I got a baby on the way. I'm just gonna take all this and I'm gonna move somewhere else or maybe even move out of the country where there's no you know, extradition policy with the US and I'm just gonna retire. Like I got enough to really retire right now. No nah, man, that yeah. that ain't that ain't how to, that ain't like how you go in the streets, man. Like that's not on cliche. Cause what happens is when you start getting that money like that, man, it become a high. You know, I didn't use drugs, I didn't drink, but count money and, 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 and running it through the machines was my high. You know, and um. And being able to help other people, but again, I'm helping people, but I'm hurting a lot of people to help these other people. You know what I mean? But at that time, I'm, I'm not, man. I, you know, the money is uh, that's my drug. You know, getting the money. You know, so I, I wouldn't, I wasn't thinking to say, okay, I got enough money. I'm gonna get out. I got, a, I got a kid coming. I want to be free. I'm not. I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking like that. You know. I'm. You're not. You just not thinking like that, man. You chasing. You chasing a bag. You know. You chasing that bag. You know. So, when you get busted, and you know they essentially caught you red-handed with with cocaine all around you. How did you feel at that point? Did you feel like okay, well, I got some lawyer money. I'm going to beat all this, or did you feel I'm gonna like tell you what I okay, felt this is, when I got this a, when I got arrested that night? I accepted it right then. I said it's, it's over. Like like immediately out the gate, wasn't no in denial. Man, I'm just gonna beat this case. It was those conversations with my older partners who told me, man, you jump off the porch, you get caught up for whatever you choose to do. You gotta accept the consequences. Cause if you tell, we gonna kill you. See, that's what I—that's the cloth I come from up under. I come up under a different cloth, you know. And, and so I heard guys say to me, like, "Man, how can you do all that time?" I didn't—I don't. It wasn't a choice. I didn't have no option. Didn't—didn't didn't nobody make me do what I did? I did it because I chose to do it, so I had to accept what came with that, you know. And um, you know, I know—I know guys that um chose to not stand up like me and say, man, I, you know, I want to be with my family, you know? And I say, you know, we we knew we wanted to be with our family when we when we chose to get in the streets. It, it, it come with the territory, you know? So um, never did I at one time, and they came to me on three different occasions. So when guys say they don't approach them about cooperating, I know it's bullshit. They gonna approach you, man. They gonna approach you because a lot of guys, they not gonna accept no 35, 40 years and no life sentences. They gonna take their chances and sacrifice some other people to get a break. But that's just that's okay. just a choice that, that 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 I couldn't make or I would never make. 
So, so as you're going through this whole legal process now, they, they sat down with you. Did they ever say, listen, give up all these people and you could walk free? Or were they saying, give up all these people and we'll give you 10, 15 years, so five years, something what, like what, that? It's here. It's here. It's here. We got the drug ledgers, right? We see all these guys that's doing business with you, right? We want these guys over here, right? Help us get these guys. We'll change your name. We'll put you in protective witness program. We'll, we'll, whoever you want to go with, you can go. And you might do for our years. And I said to them, man, I can't, I can't, there's no way I can help you with that offer you just said, you know? And so I sent my lawyers to them and told them, how about give me 15 years, I'll take it, because I'm young, you know? I'll take 15 years and I'll give you an X amount of money, I'll forfeit the money and get the money to you. They said, not with you. We, we can't, we, we, you know, our hands tied. It was, it was from, uh, from high up. They was like, on your only option, man, you, 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 got, to, you got to help yourself. And I said, man, I, I, can't, I can't help myself that way, man. It's, I'm, it's not in me. I'm not one of them guys, you know. And they said, well, later on down the line, and one of these officers, he, he, he used to try to tell me to get out the streets, man. He, he came and talked to me, man. And he said, hey, man, do you help yourself, man? He said, man, I know you got money. Don't spend the rest of your life in prison. Just help them, man. Talk to the FBI. And say your ass, man, and just change your life. And I told him, Mike, I, I can't do that, man. I, I can't do that. Well, I mean, because you talk about, well, you know, in the lifestyle that you're in, you know, people who rat, they get killed. Some, right? some, 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 they're some, telling you. some of them do. Some of them do. But yeah. listen, even if I wasn't going to get killed, I, I never rat. It ain't even about because because I, I don't I don't fear no man though like in real life but God though like and and, and like I've been like as since I stepped off the porch in the streets though like it was like the strong won't survive and the weak gonna get crushed and I ain't gonna get crushed I'm gonna do the crushing if my hand be forced right so t- cooperating man and sacrificing to other people for freedom when I got caught for what I was doing to me is not an option man. That's not an option. Today is is is, right. is options today because the majority of the guys who doing it now, when they get in a situation like mine, they're gonna cooperate. It's a fact. Right. So even though you had a baby that I guess was born right after you got my arrested, son Lamar. Yeah, he he was born. And, he was born February the tenth. Yeah. Yeah. And and they offered to take you and your whole family change your name, put you in Idaho somewhere where no one will ever find you, where you don't have, you won't fear any repercussions from all the people that you told on, you still said, no, I'm not going to tell anybody. I like, I, like, I like your question, man. That's a good question, man. But at the end of the day, much as I love my son and love my family, a rat, ratting is not an option with me, man. It's not an option. It, it's my son and my family and friends, they're not going to look at me ever and say Duro turned into a rat. So the consequences that, that I had to accept with my actions, I had to make the best out of it. And I had to live with them choices, man. I, I, I couldn't. So if somebody say, you, you, why you wouldn't do that for your son? My son wouldn't want me to be a rat. My, if I was a rat, my son wouldn't respect me. His respect for me is more important than my me trying to get my freedom to sacrifice somebody else, man. That, you know, that's just something that I, that I'm not willing to do. You know. So when you got swept up, did they did they sweep up the rest of your crew as well, or were you just the only one? Yeah, I was the only one originally got indicted. Then they indicted a co-defendant because he was the one being shown and coming into the apartment bringing the cocaine. And I was the one cooking it, so they they end up having to indict him. Okay. So it was only so basically just two of you. Yeah, it was only I. So I didn't take the crew with me. Okay, so you basically could have gotten 
what, dozens of people locked up? Oh, for sure. cooperated? Oh, without a doubt. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. But, you know, because okay. of that, that's why guys all around the country respect me, too, though. And, you can't, and to me, you can't put no value on respect. Okay. So your lawyer comes in and said, okay, give, give this young kid 15 years. They said, no, we can't do that. Did you end up taking a plea deal or did you actually blow trial? No, I went to, I went to trial. Yeah, I, I, went to, oh, I, I told okay. them I got to get in the box. Okay, you actually went to trial with a whole, with the, it was a jury trial, I guess? Yes. How much money did you spend on lawyers? Well, at the time, I, you know, back then, my first lawyer, I, I paid like 160000 Um, Some people think that's a lot of money, but back then, you know, the type of money, the, that era, that, that, that 80s, early 90s, um, hustling guys, it was a different breed, man. I'm just saying they, they, you know, they, they, they was smart, you know, they, um, they was they they was wise. They was go getters, you know. They 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 jumped they jumped in the game of hustling, but they were serious about hustling, you know. So they wanted money. They wanted they wanted a lot of money, you know. So now on today, a lot of the guys hustling, unfortunately, they drug addicts, man. They are all high. Like I'm talking about off exotic drugs. So it's just a, a whole different men mentality now as far as what guy is hustling, you know. And, and, and okay. even today, myself, you know, I try to give advice to dudes even if I'm having a town hall meeting, I send subliminal messages, you know. What I just be trying to tell to, to, to people, because I don't judge people, right? Dudes go hustle, man. Sometimes dudes hustling, man, because... They circumstances force them to hustle. Everybody might not agree with it, but you know, we all do what we do. And I always just tell guys that I know, I'm like, man, you know, you know, if you're gonna hustle, man, all I'm saying is, man, if you know, if them people come, man, just stand up, man, and, and take what you got coming, man. Don't don't take nobody else with you, man. Just, you know, you go, man. You know, I ain't take nobody with me. You know, they had drug ledgers with, with, with 50, 60 dudes' names on them, though. I ain't, you know, man, I'm telling them, man, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know nothing about what you're talking about, man. I don't know what that man doing. You know? Okay. So it, it goes to trial, and you're convicted for conspiracy to distribute 68 pounds of crack cocaine. It's, Which it's, I guess was it's conspiracy to distribute crack, manufacturing, um, possession with intent to distribute, and use and carry of a firearm during a drug a drug transaction. Those were the charges, because the manufacturing come from cooking, from from cooking. That's where the manufacturing charge come from. You know the bogus okay. hundred to one crack ratio that they had that was targeted at African Americans. 100 to 1 ratio, you know about all that, which all of it was to clean up the inner cities with the guys that they felt was a threat that was getting a bunch of money, man. That's all that was about. I didn't get 35 years for selling no um, cocaine. I got 35 okay. years because they felt I was a threat and they needed to get, get this boy up off the streets. When, when you hear the jury, you know, announce... That, that you're guilty. Well, okay. I mean, the, the 35 years came later, right? First uh -huh. you get the guilty plea and right. then they do the sentencing later, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So you're sitting there in court. You're, you're 20 years old or 21? Like how long uh, did, you know, uh, did it take for the court I'm, case? I'm, tw I'm 21 then. I'm 21 then. By the time I'm sentencing, came, I'm 21. Okay. Okay, you're 21 years old. You're, you're legally just allowed to drink <laughs> during right. this yeah, time. Legally, legally you know, just allowed to drink. I had to buy the bar out in the turf club for them to let to let me get in my own party. Yeah. You know, most most suburban kids of your age are in college, going to frat parties, and 
you know, having sex with sorority girls and, right. you know, you know, going to school and so forth. You just heard, you know, the jury finds you guilty at 21 years old. What what went through your mind when you heard that guilty verdict? I mean, remember I told you, man, when um when they when they kick, when they came through that door, and put them cuffs on me. I said, man, all the pretty girlfriends, man, and the fights in Vegas and Rodeo Drive, and count all the money, the party's over. So what I'm saying is. The fact that I accepted that reality from the start, when that guilty verdict came, I was already preparing myself mentally for that, you know? But I didn't think they was gonna give me 35 years because of my record. But what they did was, they got these different enhancements, where they put these enhancements on your original guidelines, and then your sentence go from here to here. And with me, any enhancement they could get away with with me, they gave it to me because they were trying to pressure me to tell. They felt like if they gave me enough time that I was going to break. So by the time I got sentenced, my guideline ran from 20 years to where they can give me a life sentence. So the judge could have gave me okay. life. And the only reason I don't think Judge Jensen gave me life I didn't have a bad record. They didn't have no violence tied to my case. And it would have looked really bad at the time if he said life and that mean I was going to die in jail. I think if, if they felt they can get away with it, it wouldn't look too bad on them. That, that's what they gave to me because they was upset that I wouldn't cooperate. Okay, but still, you're a 21-year-old given a 35-year-old sentence. A 35-year sentence. That means that you 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 had to realize that you're going to be getting out at 56 years old, you know, in the worst case scenario. Um, but you had already accepted that at that point. Yeah, I, I, I did, man. I, I had to. I mean, I was gonna fight. I was gonna fight and try to get them some of the time back because I felt like the enhancements was was illegal, which a couple of them was. The gun, the, the gun that they charged me with, the jury found me not guilty of that gun. But the judge still turned around and gave me five years for that gun. And then they also gave me a four-point enhancement, which means a leader and an organizer of five or more people. I only had one co-defendant. They still gave me that enhancement, and then when I appealed it to the appeals court, they still denied it. So, I mean, at the end of the day, they gave me 15 more years than that, that they should have ever gave, given to me. You know, but it is the, that's how the court system is designed. Okay, so you get your 35-year sentence, and now you begin your prison stay. And I guess during the course of you being in prison, they moved you around. You know, I guess you started Oakland, but then you went to Los Angeles, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Texas, Oregon. You were being moved around from, from pen to pen. Well, they were trying to break my spirits, you know. The first prison they sent me to now, I'm from California, right? After I get a sentence, they sent me to Ashland, Kentucky, someplace I ain't never heard of. Throughout my prison stay, they ended up sending me to 14 different prisons which is unheard of. It took 15 years before they even let me come to California. Because they said I okay. had too much influence. Right, because here you are with a newborn son and they're sending you to Kentucky and Oklahoma. And, and I mean, that's messing you up at this point in terms of actually even seeing your, your son or, or your girl or your mother or your yeah. father and so forth. Yeah, they don't care. They didn't care about I had no newborn son and my mom and daddy and all that. The feds don't operate like that. But the beauty of it was that for me, I had an already started processing all these thoughts in my head. And what I processed in my head was no matter where they send me, I'm going to make arrangements to be able to see my kid, right? And I'm going to build a relationship with him 
so that I can have some type of effect on him where he can say, even though my dad left me out here, he did everything in his willpower to be a, the best father figure to me that he possibly can. So I had already started processing all these things in my head. And the, and the blessing for me was, was that I still had some money put up and I had people that I looked out for who had not made it that would allow for me to do that time as comfortable as possible. So I had the opportunity to fly my son to visit me and build a relationship with my family and friends. So that was my blessing throughout my journey. Okay. You know, in a bus like this, you know, you get arrested, but they try to seize everything they possibly could between cars and money uh -huh. and property and so forth like that. How much did they actually seize from you when, when they ultimately finished their whole case on you? Well, they, 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 didn't, they didn't find a bunch of money and stuff like that for me. They found some money here and there or whatnot. But where I also out of a lot of my stuff is when you get all that time, you have to trust somebody. You got to let people owe money. You got to let people have their, your, their properties and their names. And majority of the guys that you have a conversation with that did a bunch of those years, throughout those years, family and friends, they going to spend that money, man. Because they feel like you don't need it, though. Like they, In their mind, they say, all you need is some money to go to the commissary and get on the phone. You know, and I'm talking about dudes, moms, dads, wives, aunties. I know guys who, you know, their brothers and, and cousins ran through five, ten million dollars of their money. You know, I ain't talking about no jump change. But these are the things that happen with what I call the game. You know, but, but when, I, when I say the game, I say it with, with, with the real meaning of it, man. The game, not a game, like you play games, the game, man, that, that we grew up in, you know, my generation, you know. That's why we, we, take, we take the game serious because we know what come with it. Okay. So essentially, all these people that you trusted, did, did all of them essentially rip you off? No, 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 not, not all, not, not all, not all. And, and I would never, um, I would never drop no names on no people who screw me out a certain thing or none of that because that's just not me, man. I, I'm not, I'm not vengeful. I'm not, I'm not bitter at them. All those things that I experienced came with the choices I made when you were in the game. Because at the end of the day, when we hustling and getting money, we know at the end of the day it's, it's, it's dirty money anyway. I mean, that's just the truth for the matter. It's, it's dirty money, though, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know? You start going through this prison sentence, and at one point you actually become a grandfather in prison. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I become a grandfather, yeah. Okay. As you're doing all these years, you know, for your principles, because at any, at any point, you know, it's, I'm sure, especially in the beginning, you know, you could shave off years by changing your mind and giving up all these people, but, but you, you keep doing these years and years. What do you think was the hardest thing personally of, of doing that many decades, you know, over and over again? Because you ultimately did 26 years, right? No, 27 years, 10 months. 27. 27 years, 10 months. What was the hardest part during all those 27 years and 10 months that, that you went through personally? Um, knowing that my family and friends was, was in pain and hurting the fact that, you know, I wasn't there with them and I knew it. Even though me, I was dealing with it like, you know, because I, I, I knew what I was doing, so I had to deal with it though. But, but I knew that my kids, my family, the pain that they was going through with me being gone, gone for so long, you know, that was, that was more harder than me during the time. I mean, when you talk about prisons and you talk about the gang politics between the Crips, the Bloods, the Black Gorillas, the, the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Nation, um, MS-13, like it, it goes on and on and on. How did you personally remain safe during all that time? Was there, did you ever 
you know, experience any violence against yourself during any of those 27 years? No, because for one, um, I would be considered a, a civilian, right? Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not in no gang. I wasn't in no gang. I had a crew. I, I, I wasn't in no gang. I had a, I had a crew, you know. I wasn't, I wasn't gang banging on you because you from a different neighborhood. So I wasn't under no prison politics, though. So I, I can deal with whoever I wanted to deal with. Because sometimes once you become a part of a specific group in prison, then the politics get involved. Where you can't deal with a certain individual. When I, or for us with me, I dealt with who I wanted to deal with. Whether they was ABs, um, Crips, Blood, GDs, it didn't make no difference. I, I deal with who I want to deal with. I don't, I, I, didn't, I don't answer to nobody about who I dealt with. And, and, and that's why I was able to move around and how I wanted to move around. But I also built all these relationships with these guys from different parts of the country because I'm open-minded to not thinking in a box, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, you were locked up at the same time. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know whether you guys ever crossed paths or not, but, you know, Big Meech from BMF was locked up while you were still in prison. Did you guys ever ever meet up? You know, cross paths at all or no? I ain't never ran into Big Meech. Yeah, I no, I ain't never ran into Big Meech. No, I've never ran into Big Meech. No, I never ran into okay. Big Meech. You're, you're doing these thirty five years, mm. but at one point, something happened where Obama, you know, actually changed your future. So explain to me how you were able to actually get off and how Obama was involved in that. Okay, so what happened was um, I had pretty much ex- exhausted all my appeals, you know. And over the years, I had spent more money on hiring appeal attorneys. And I got to a point where I said I wasn't going to spend no more money paying no lawyers. I only had a time, I only had like three years and some left on my sentence that I had been already did 25 years, you know. You get to a point, man, when you you do that many amount of years, you just say, man, I'm going to go ahead and do the rest that I got to do, you know? So at the time, Obama is considering clemencies for nonviolent drug offenders. For, for people like me that don't know, explain to me what exactly clemency means. Okay. So a clemency is when you put in a request to the to the White House to, re, to for a sentence computation, meaning it's not a pardon, but it's a computation of whatever sentence that you have. So you are asking for a time cut on that sentence. So a pardon is when your record get clean. You don't have no whatever crime you got charged with a pardon wipes that clear. A uh, clemency is just a computation of your sentence. So what he did for me is I had these bunch of people write letters on my behalf from the communities. And the reason they wrote these letters on my behalf while in prison, I started setting up conference calls at some of these community centers, having town halls with young youngsters that look up to dudes like me, where we do Q and A's, they ask me questions I answer. Some of their parents would ask me questions, and I answer these questions, and I give them honest feedback and honest advice about the consequences of certain choices that they make. You know, and throughout the years, some of these parents thanked me for having these kind of honest conversations with their kids. So I had already started having these conversations with the young people while I was in prison. So when time came, when they started giving out these clemencies, I got these letters on my behalf sent in in support of my package, the receipt clemency. And then my buddy Hammer, you know, Hammer went to the White House knocking on the doors about me, saying he wanted to talk to them about my situation or whatnot. So having these letters of support from our families and friends, when they look at these packages, they looking at the risk. They looking at the crime you committed, how long you been in prison, 
what type of criminal record you already had before you, you got arrested, and then they'll make their decisions based upon all this information they have. With me, my age, the type of support that I had from the individuals allowed Obama to take the chance and grant me the clemency, and that's how I received the clemency from Obama. But my attorney, her name is Brittany Barnett. She's out of Texas, right? She the one filed my clemency petition for me. She has gotten about eight individuals like myself out of prison under clemency. And I think she deserves more credit and recognition because I don't know if you're familiar with the lady, Miss Alice, that Kim Kardashian went to the White House and, and went and talked to Trump about it and got her about that life sentence. My attorney is the first person that filed a clemency on that of Ms. Atlas's behalf. So that's what a clemency is for the people who don't know what a clemency is. Because I'm still on probation, though. People thought I got out and I don't have probation. I'm on probation. They just cut my sentence. Okay, and how many years probation did you get? They gave me five years probation, which I got... I, that's not bad at all. Right, which I got to turn in a, a monthly report once a month, you know, showing my in income, um, just a monthly report checking in, and then every now and then they come by, do a house check, go down there. I don't have to piss or nothing like that because I wasn't a drug user, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to piss in a bottle or nothing like that. So that's what, a clemency, that's what a clemency is. Okay, and I guess Obama granted 110 people clemency altogether, including yourself. He, no, he, he, he granted more than 110 people. No, Obama, Obama blessed some people, man. He, he changed some lives, man. And Obama, man, if you ever see this, I want to thank you, man, for granting me that clemency and bringing me back to my family, man, three years and some earlier than, than it would be, man. I, I appreciate that, man. You, um, you blessed a lot of us, man. And without you, a whole lot of us would still be in prison, man. Okay. So, so the prosecutor in your case is a guy named Russ uh, Giuntini? Yeah, uh, see, Russ, Robert Dandero was the one that really took my case. At the time, Russ Giuntini was the chief district attorney over there. And for some reason, he had his heart on for me, man. You know? <laughs> right, because, you know, after, after Obama gave you clemency, he he made some comments about you specifically. Oh, for sure. He said, this is like, he said, this is like commuting Al Capone's sentence. Yeah, he, John he, he compared sentence. me to Al Capone. He should, he should serve every day because of all the harm he did to the community. Yeah, but you, you know what I find interesting about that is like, it got to be personal with this guy. For, for me to do, I didn't do 28 years for a nonviolent crime, right? Bottom line, I wasn't charged with no violence, though. You, you know, I, I, I charged for selling drugs. So for him to come out on TV or news, so as he hear I got granted clemency, and compare me to um, Al Capone and them was hilarious. Okay. Right? He said... <laughs> He, he said, man, that little dude is dangerous, you know? This is what he said, though. But, um, and it's nothing personal. And then when somebody spoke with him about that, he said, man, I ain't, I ain't got nothing against Lil D, you know? It ain't nothing personal, you know? That was, I was just speaking my opinion. But, man, I done been in jail 28 years, man. Like, uh, at what point is enough enough for a nonviolent drug crime, you know? And so, um... And I ain't got nothing personal against him neither. You know, he, you know, he's a district attorney, and some of them they think one way: punish, punish, punish. Describe to me the feeling you had when you walked out of that prison cell for the first day and saw daylight, you know, without a cage around you. When my original, one of my original attorneys, not for a peer, told me that she had this young attorney that she wanted me to talk to because she can probably help me get my clemency granted. I told her no. I said, I'm tired of dealing with these lawyers. I'm not giving them no more money. I got, th this is how you become used to being in jail. And then in three years, 
to a person who ain't been in jail. You're like, man, what? But I had been in so many years, man. This was my new world, right? I'm like, man, I got three years and something to do, man. I'm just going to do this shit, you know? So my lawyer, Diana, convinced me to talk to Brittany about my case. And I'll never forget this. So the administration made arrangements for me to talk to this lady on the phone for about an hour. I told her about my case. She was moved by it. She cried after we got off the phone because she couldn't understand why they robbed me of my whole life at that age for selling drugs, right? So, make a long story short, she convinced me after that hour conversation to let her, she said, I'm going to get you home. She said, you, you got a, the prime case for these clemencies. Just let me, just let, I, I, let me do it, you know? And I said, okay, I ain't got nothing to lose, you know what I mean? <laughs> make a long story short, a little bit, two months after that conversation with her, my unit manager comes to me and tells me to come to his office at a certain time. I got an attorney call. And something told me, with the, the smile that he had when he told me to come to his office, I said, man, they didn't gave me this shit. Right? It, it was an eerie feeling, though, right? An eerie feeling. So I goes in there. And, you know, everybody know me on the, I'm always popular in these prisons because, you know, you know, you got MC Harper coming to visit me. You got E-40 coming to visit me. You got Gary Payton. You got Too Short. You know, these dudes don't come in prison, man. They don't, man, but they come to see me, right? So I'm always this popular guy on these compounds, right? So when I go in this office, I see these secretary chicks. They seem like they jolly, you know? They seem jolly. But I, I know why they jolly, right? They didn't heard what this phone conversation's gonna be about. So I get something on the phone, right? And so my attorney, Brittany, she says, um, hey, Daryl. You know, she a country girl. I said, what's up, Britt? And I can hear her chuckling. And then she said, Diana on the phone. Now, mind you, Diana was my prior attorney, but Diana found Brittany for me. She said, guess what? Ah! They started hollering on the phone. And she said, Obama granted Joe Clemency today. You going home, girl. And I was, and, and I'm telling you, man, like, you would have thought, like, man, what's wrong with this fool, right? I just, like, sat there and I was like, yeah, right? Like, this real calm type of, yeah, right? And they they just screamed and you know they you know and they thanked the Lord and like it was his testimony on his phone you know and I'm sitting there and I'm like wow you know I'm taking it in you know and one of them said and, um how you feel and I don't remember exactly what I said but I, I said it's something sarcastic you know I said it's something I like um. Shit, they overdo or some shit. I said, you know, some, some, you know, I didn't, hey man, I didn't been in this motherfucker for like 27 years, man. Like, I didn't adapt it to my environment, you know? So, um, make a long story short. So, from the day that I got granted it, they, it's a process that they do. So, I, I wasn't gonna go home until, um, October. They granted it in August. I wasn't gonna go home till October the 16th of 2016, you know? So, I, I, they congratulate me in the office, the staff. And then when I come out, now all these guys know I'm waiting to hear. You know, they, I'm waiting to hear this news. And man, when I came out of that office, it was some dudes when they said, and I told them, man, some of them guys started crying. And, and these is men, man. These, are, these ain't no, you know, these is... That's how happy and joyful they was for me, right? And, you know, I'm keeping my cool and shit, you know? And it's a trip, right? Because now I'm like, and now all these thoughts went through my head. And I'm like, damn, right? Now I'm trying to just figure out, like, the first thing I want to do when I get out, you know? And my partner has told me, like, from that day until when I left, 
They saw some in my, and they saw some in my face. That was, you know, I don't walk around sad in prison. My my spirits is always high though. But they say they saw a glow in me, man. And it seemed like that um that I that I just was was given, you know, a second chance at life though. Like you know, it was I didn't even realize though. They told me it was a pep in my step. That they, if they say it seemed like man, I was like in heaven, you know, like just my my whole that energy just off of me, you know, and so um, you know, them them two months, man, and some was the longest two months out of all them years. I bullshit you not, man, because I couldn't sleep. You know, my my mind. I was thinking about okay, what what I'm, what I'm gonna do, man, to, to, to get my life back in order, and like I'm kind because I'm you know my mind is racing, you know, and so um that time came, and um I have been suppressing my feelings, right? So the day I get released, you know, I go and do my dress out, put my clothes on, and all that. All the staff. They heard the news. They was coming to me, congratulating me, and saying you should have. They should have been let you out and all that. So I, you know, you got to go through R&D. They got to fingerprint you. They got to take pictures. They got to ID. It's a, it's a long drawn out process. You got to go through, man. Like it's, it's crazy. But this is what they got to do, man. They got to. Everybody got to sign off on before they release you from 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 federal custody. You know, all these different departments. You know, you got to go through, right? So. After I went through all the process, man, I started walking through this corridor that you got to walk to that front door. And um, as I'm walking, now I got all these pent up emotions in me, right? And man, when I seen that door, the cry, the cry that came out of me, man, I never knew I had them emotions. So I said to the officer, I said, hey, man, I apologize, man. I said, man, I, I never knew this was going to feel this way. And he, I never forget it. He said, hey, he said, Reed, he said, hey, man, the time you just did it, man, you should have been crying. He said, so, so all that you've been, you know, holding in, that's the best thing you could have did what you just did. And man, I ain't gonna lie, man. I was crying like a crocodile, man. You know, it, it was a cold reality, man. And, and then when I got to the parking lot, you know, out that last door, and I seen that parking lot when my visitors come to visit and come in, Man, it was it was a, a it was an out of body experience though, man. It was like it was like a feeling I couldn't explain though, like man, you know. And then when I got in the van, oh, it, it was a, it's a camp there in Sheridan, Oregon. I'm in Sheridan, Oregon. It's a camp there, and there's some guys out there cleaning up. Cause when you camp, you got out, you can be outside the premises. You low you you low security, minimum security. Some guys that know me seen me. And you would have thought they was getting out of prison, man. So the word spread immediately. Them dudes got on the phone, calling around and telling them. So I go to the airport. And man, when I got to that airport and seen all these people moving around on these cell phones, if you'd have seen the expression on my face, I was in another world, man. Like I, I was the look, the look that was on me was like a person that you just let out of a cave. I mean, that's that's how 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 long I had been gone. Like when I seen all these people on their phones with their head down on texting and bumping into each other, man, it freaked me out, man. Because because it was so these people was moving so fast, right? And then in prison, you got to be kind, man. You got to say, excuse me, if you bump into somebody, man. You, you know, you got to say, excuse me. You got to, you got to, you know, because it's a respect thing. 
So when I see you know you people bumping at each other with their head down and whatnot, they freak me out. And I'm like, man, what, this is crazy. And so I never forget it. My girlfriend took a picture of me. And man, I was standing, if you see how I was standing there looking, you might have felt sorry for me. Because you realize that, man, this dude, this is a whole nother world this dude is in. And it's going to take some, some adapting for him to adapt to this new reality, you know? You've actually been in prison longer than you've been out of prison. Yeah, eight years more than I was in the free world, you know? Yeah. That's tough on any anybody, you know. And 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 it also um, being in prison for that long and you know, away from society, even if you're strong minded, it's gonna be some things you gotta work through to to cope with this real world out here. And for me, I had some defense mechanisms up, man, and because I was tired of people giving me orders, telling me to do this, telling me to do that. So for me, when I felt people, even though they were trying to help me or give me advice, a lot of times I was defensive about them trying to help me. And I had to work through that, but it was, it was really, really tense. The first eight, nine months of me coming back out here in this world trying to adapt, man, you know, which is understandable, you know. But that's going to be for anybody who's being, being incarcerated for that period of time, you know what I mean? And if they say they didn't have no issues, I believe they lying. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I know, I know good guys, yeah. they didn't lost their mind being in prison that long. Like, they didn't turn to, to, to drugs, psychotic drugs because it's challenging though you got to have a strong mind and will to be in that small cell for decades you know no, absolutely you know and when you look at when you look at the history of what you did and you know you balled out of control you had millions of dollars you had all the cars you had all the girls but what you had to do in order to achieve that, do you feel like he was worth it or no? Oh, no, not, not at all. <laughs> I, I, tell, I tell people that all the time, and like if you talk to guys that's in prison in a similar situation like myself with a lot of time, if they be honest, they will tell you that no matter how much money they made or had, it wasn't worth doing no 30 years of no life in prison, man. You know, I never tell, I never try to tell people, man, I had all this money when I was young. I experienced all these things, man. So it was worth me doing, you no, know, 28 years, man. To me, that I would be a damn fool to be promoting something like that to some, to some people that I'm trying to keep it real with. You know what I mean? Right. Because, you know, and we had, we had, you know, touched on this before. I, I was too young to experience, you know, what you were going through. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a few years younger than, than you, and I was also, you know, not I, I was living in the peninsula instead of the East Bay. Uh -huh. But you know, I got to I got to hang out with with Big Meech and BMF, uh -huh. and, and I got to see, you know, this th this huge you know, drug empire on a level that I've never seen before where they had billboards in Atlanta that said the world is BMFs and they had, they would pull up to the club and spend, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars with Lamborghinis and Ferraris and everything else like that. And, and just like yourself, all of them got busted, you know, big Meech, you know, and they didn't really catch him with anything, but they caught him on conspiracy where I think he's doing like 35 years. I think something 30, similar to 30, yourself. 30. And, 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 yeah, 30. Yeah, 30 years, yeah. And, and it kind of reminds me, you know, the story, the, the, the BMF story really kind of reminds me of the story that you're telling me where these guys balled out of control for a certain amount of time and ultimately all the main guys all are, I mean, they're still in prison. You know, when, when you look at how history repeats itself over and over again, where these young guys that come from, you know, from the hood go and make all this money 
and then ultimately the feds sweep them up again, you know, how does that make you feel? It's a cycle. I mean, it's a, it's a repeat it's a cycle, you know. Generation, generation, generation. It just keep going, you know. It's it's little d, it's little d's in every major city around the world, you know. And and that's that's this is true though. This ain't me just saying this. It's little d's in every city around the world, though, you know. But people got different personalities. People got different methods on how they look at life, on how they operate, you know. Um, some people don't need power because they abuse it, you know. Some people with money abuse that because they use their money to try to control everything around them. They buy, try to buy friendships. Um, but far as the, the, the streets itself, they never, people go, especially in America, right? Nobody consumes more drugs than Americans, man. It's, it's facts, though. Like, what I'm saying is the demand, right? That's not going to change, though. Like, 30 years from now, it's going to be another big niche. It's going to be another little detail. What I'm, all I'm saying is, is that as long as the people cons- demand the drugs, drugs is not going nowhere, though. Like, they're not going nowhere. You know, they're they not going nowhere, man. You know, you know when, when you sit back now, as you know, you're how old now? Um, uh, I just made 50 today. Oh, so really? you you, okay. you got my interview on my birthday, man. It's legendary, man. <laughs> legendary on your fiftieth birthday, at at fifty years old. You know, because you know we talked about earlier in the interview, eighteen, nineteen years old. You weren't thinking about the damage you were doing. You weren't thinking about the the crack babies. You know, you weren't talking. You you weren't thinking about the the prom queens who ended up, you know, as prostitutes with missing teeth and you, you know and and the the devastation that you were causing, the, the the multi-generational devastation that you were causing. But now as a 50-year-old who has a full-grown son and a grandson who I just met, you know, uh, while we took a break, how do you feel about what you did now? Oh, when I look back, but I had these conversations when I have these little town halls. I know that my actions and what I did way back then affected a lot of people's lives and changed their lives for the worst. I, I know that for a fact, you know, because of what crack did, though, you know? And, and I've never shied away from that, you know? But, but also, like I tell people, though, like, I'm not going to be the, um, one of them persons that hide away and shy away from what my journey has been, you know? My journey is what my journey is. And I tell people who, who want to always try to judge people, I tell them, man, judge yourself too, though. Like, you know, you might not say or crack, you know, but you didn't say it too. So I don't shy away from that, man. You know, I, I know that when we, when we was doing what we was doing out here and we was rocking, I know that in... Um, it damaged our communities back back then with that crack shit, man. Crack shit damaged a, a lot of people, man, for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. Right. And, and the cycle didn't repeat with your family. Like, your son, who I just met, didn't follow the footsteps of his dad. No, because I, I, I made sure that I had those conversations with him to, to, to get him to understand he didn't want to he didn't want to go down that, that path I took, you know? <laughs> Because then he'd be leaving his son out there to fend for himself, you know. So, but me and dude got, yeah. a, me and my son got a pretty cool relationship. When well, you know, every now and then we we see different on different things. But any father and son with that. But for the most part, I know that I had an effect on him where he didn't turn out to be no terrible kid, you know. And I got a daughter too, man. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, I got a daughter named Cornisha, man. I got a daughter, and I didn't know about her until she was 11 years old. 
Oh, because someone else was pregnant also at the time. And I got a mysterious oh, okay. letter in the mail. You know, you know, one of them letters like, man, hey, what's, what is this? Huh. It's, what is this girl I'm talking about, man? I ain't got no daughter. She trying to dump a baby on me, man. And then, you know, she said, no, I want to pay for the blood test. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, how you know this is my baby? You know, you know how you go through that. You in denial. Mm -hmm. And make a long story short, I took the blood test. And, and, she, and she was my daughter. And I always wanted a daughter and a son. I used to tell my partners in prison, man, damn, I done came in and got all this time. And I ain't got no daughter. <laughs> and then 11 years after I'm in prison, lo and behold, I had a daughter out there that I didn't know nothing about. So what happens when, when these young guys walk up to you and say, listen, I want to be the next little D. Like, I, I've been hearing about you my whole life. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be bigger than you. And, and I'm not going to make your mistakes. I'm not going to get caught by the feds. I'm going to be, because I'm, I'm smarter than you. And, and I'm, I'm going to move slicker. And I'm going to stay under the radar. And I'm going to make a billion dollars. And no one's ever going to catch me. What do you tell these guys? Well, I got a saying when I be um, speaking in front of these youngsters. I tell them, man, if you're trying to be like me, you're a damn fool. And then they asked me, why would I be a damn fool? I said, man, I just did 28 years in prison. I, you want to be like me? And then I tell to them, I tell them that they need to think about the consequences. I, I tell to them, okay, let's say you do make you X amount of dollars, right? But you end up going to prison for 10, 15, 20 years, right? Ask yourself, is that worth you doing? And then if you say, if you come to the conclusion, yeah, then live with that if you get caught up. And those are the type of conversations I had with them because I can't tell no people who might not, you know, have no other trade that they know to feed their family. I can't just tell them what they can't do, but I can explain to them what the consequences are for certain choices that they make then they have to make those choices and decide on how they want to go about doing it. Just like me and everybody else, though. But I've always lived with my choices that I make, though. Like, whether you agree with them or not, though, I can live with, I can live with that. With all the people that you've ever met, you know, all the, you know, because when you're at the level that you're at, you know, we mentioned Freeway Ricky Ross. You know, th these are your peers. These are people that, that you know and you deal with and you guys have, the, the, you know, your own types of relationships. Was there anyone who got at a level, a similar high level, who actually didn't get caught by the feds and end up doing a, a ton of time or ended up dead? Did anybody ever actually, and you don't have to name any names, but did anyone actually slip under the radar and get away and, and, you know, sail off into the sunset. There's a few guys who, 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 who was able to, they made it, man. You know, however they made it, they made it, man. But I know a whole bunch of good dudes. They didn't make it, man. They might they might have had a, a 10 or 15 year run. But guess what? It only take one time. It it, yeah. it 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 only take one time, man. And you know what amazes me out here now, though, Vladi, is a lot of these rappers, right? <clears throat> they rapping about the dudes like me and others. You know what I mean? And I life stories, you know. And I'm not mad at them for for rapping about these stories because they storytellers, you know. But what I have an issue with is the information that's getting embraced and supported and the stories that should be getting supported, produced on the TV screen, the TV series. For example, this white boy, Rick, you, you familiar with the story out of Detroit? Yeah. So that story, right? Here go a guy, the whole Detroit know it. He was a rat, right? They do this movie about him, right? They do this movie about him. They put the money up, they produce it, they put it out there, right? 
he's supposed to be representing the culture, as they say, the culture, right? How can these stories be worthy of being produced, told to the world, but a story like my story, right? Where the president grants me this clemency, writes me this letter, because I've already started from on the inside of having dialogue with younger guys and having an effect on some of them to make better choices. How is it that my story doesn't get told to the world, but white boy Rick's story, a, a bona fide rat, gets a movie done on his life story? This is something that I, I cannot understand how this is happening in 2018 when you got authentic stories like my story. Again, my age separates me from Big Meech, Freeway Rick, Bo Bennett. We can go on and on, man. My story separates from them based upon facts. They didn't do what I did at such a young age, right? They didn't, I, I've saved lives from in prison. With being mediators from, from different situations where lies was at stake. I did all these things, but for some reason, the, the, the authentic stories, the industry don't want to tell. I don't, I'm, I'm confused with this. I'm, uh, I, just, I just don't understand it. And, and, and this is my genre, though. That like, like when you get to talking about, the streets, and you get to talk about dudes that's respected throughout the country. When you mention my name, my name is at the top when it comes to that. So those are the things that out here, I sit back sometime and I question and I'll be like, well, maybe they don't want the real to be told though, you know? Maybe they, they maybe, maybe, they want to breed and, and, and breed and encourage being a rat. That's a possibility, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, look at Whitey Bulger. They, they made a movie out of him, and he just got killed at I think eighty nine years old with his eyes torn out and his and his uh, mouth, his tongue torn out of him. You know, right when he got transferred to another prison. They killed him the, the, the first day he was there. But but let me say this too, man. When you talk about guys that was in the streets hustling and that was brilliant here, the most brilliant guy I ever met in the streets that was hustling was Michael Harris, Harry O, out of Los Angeles. That's the smartest, business-minded dude that I ever met that come from the streets. This dude thinking back way back then in the early 80s was way ahead of the game. He, he came up with a play called Broadway Mike. He had Denzel Washington and all of them a part of it. He, he had told me these ideas he had in his head. But this dude is, is so smart and brilliant. But again, you got a lot of brilliant and smart guys. They come from the inner city, man. We became D boys, man. Well, yeah, I mean, Harry O actually was the founder of Death Row, you know? I, See, I know all about his story. I, I knew about Death Row before the streets knew about it, you know? And um, these ideas, you know, I seen these logos and these ideas he had, when, you, know, you know, about this Death Row, and I heard about this guy, Snoop, Snoop Dogg, and then I seen this Snoop Dogg dude on this deep cover. It's something called Deep Cover. And this was the guy that was telling me about it. I said, he a star. He said to be a star. You know, so those story, I was connected to these things. You know, the easiest people that I had personal relationships with that, that I slept in their house, that they trusted me in their houses. Like, I had a relationship with these dudes, but I was this 19-year-old, 18-year-old young kid Hanging out with the big boys, man, and 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 they respected me, and because I was little, 
but I had a big heart, you know, and they liked the way I carried myself, you know. So here you are, 50 years old. Uh huh. You, you've done more time in prison than you've done out of prison. I'm going to assume that you're clearly out of the game 100, 110%. 120. <laughs> 120 120%. Your, your, your son has nothing to do with it. Your grandson is, is a baby. Um, what is it that you're trying to accomplish in these years that you have? you know, to leave behind a legacy more than just the street part of your legacy? Well, um, I started a, um, a truck hauling business called Quick Hauling, where I go out and, you know, when people get evicted or they move and they leave furniture and stuff, either in a house or apartment, I go out, we pick it up, we take it to the dump, and they cut me a, a, a check, right? I started a trucking company. I started a foundation, which is called the Dura Reed Foundation. And that foundation for me, basically, is for me to have dialogue with these youngsters about gun violence and about the consequences of these guns and how they, how they resort to these guns every time they had conflict. So me just having some, some real conversation with them about making better choices when it comes about these guns, you know? But I'm not no preacher. And I'm not coming out here preaching to, to the youngsters, neither one. That's not my role. My role is to give them some advice so when they make their choices, they know what type of consequences they're dealing with. You know what I mean? Um, I'm a, I've also been out here having these little parties, you know, these little events. I kind of like it. I like the chase. I like the hustle of it. But my, my girlfriend, she want me to get out of the, pro the promotion game, man, because it's, it's stressful, man, right? But I kind of, I kind of love it, man. It's like a challenge, you know what I mean? And um, so that, and then I want to get off into real estate eventually. And I also, man, want to either get a TV series on my life story where I can talk about Oakland and the Bay Area and all these different characters tied around my story for as the Black Panther, you know, the Mac. You know, all the history that come out of Oakland, I would want to tie that into my story, around my story, you know, and build all these characters. So a TV series would allow you to, 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 to include a whole bunch of content. But if a theatrical, if the right writer come in and write a script that I think is telling my story in that, in that, 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 that hour and a half window frame, then I would want to do a theatrical, a theatrical um, movie on, on my story. And I think I got a great story, you know, and that's why I wrote my book, Wait. And, and if you read my book, it's an interesting story, and I believe that the, um, the public would embrace my story, especially with the redemption part, you know, getting granted a clemency from, from Obama coming from where I come from, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, and I just want to comment because we we try to get your book, you know, before this interview, but the only place we could find it was used on Amazon. And it was like one hundred and ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't able to to get it in time. But my suggestion, if you want to reach, you know, you know, this is totally up to you. But you know, you might want to consider doing an audio book version of your book, where you actually read your book in your own voice, because that's the way see, I consume. But, see, here's the, here's the catch days, with the audio generation. for me, right? See, I got acid reflex. And before they told me that in prison that I had acid reflex, I was still eating a bunch of spicy stuff. It damaged my esophagus. So what happens is, it's days when my voice go in and out. My voice didn't totally change from the situation. Like, when people hear me talk sometimes, they think I'm in pain because it seems like it's a struggle. But I got some damage to my esophagus, and they wanted to do a surgery, and I didn't want to let them be messing around up in here, man. You know, uh -uh, you know, I, I talk a lot, man. If, if they take this thing for me, man, it might get hectic on me, right? So the point I'm making is that would kind of make it difficult for me to do the audio. But somebody told me they can help, they can clean, it's a way they can clean it up for me. 
So I would, I, and I know that would be an easy way because a lot of people don't want to read no book, you know. Yeah. But I, I, I do, I do got a book for you. I want to get to you, so you got to make sure I, I know where to mail it to. Cause I, yeah. I I brought one here thinking one of your guys from your crew probably gonna be who can get it to you. So I do got a book for you anyway, because I want you to read that book, and then you're gonna better understand my story and my journey, and you can see my organizational skills as a little kid from 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 many years ago. Absolutely. Well, listen, little D, man, I, I'm glad we finally got to uh, to sit down and do this. You know, as someone who grew up in the Bay. Uh, this was one of the most important interviews that I've wanted to do for a long time because, you know, it hits so close to home. And, you know, I'm very glad that you were able to go through this journey and come out from, you know, from it and have these types of conversations and have this type of information to share with the world because I'm sure there's lots of people who got locked up at right around the same time that you did that never made it out. Right, you know that 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 you know that 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 hung themselves in a jail cell, or or got killed over you know a petty argument, you know, or um, you know just you know just succumbed you know to the prison system where they got caught up in the system and killed somebody else and you know and, and so forth. Yeah, they ended up on death row. Those things, you know, what I'm saying it's very it's very easy. Like you, you do not hear very many people who do 27 and a half, you know, 27 years and 10 months and actually come out and are are actually have their sanity and their health and you look good and you look healthy. You know what I'm saying? I think that it's an incredible accomplishment that you you know what you've actually walked through and is able to come out, you know, from the other side from. I do want you to hurry up and read that book, man, because I think once you read it, this conversation we just had, you'll be able to paint that picture. And I think you go, you enjoy the book, and then that way you can tell them, go to my own publishing company and order my book, which is Dura Reed Publishing. Mm -hmm. When they get introduced to my story, they're going to understand it's, it's not your normal D boy story because of my age and my ability to organize people, you know. No doubt, no doubt. Well, Daryl Reed, aka Lil D, thank you so much for spending the time to tell the story, and I think that it's going to change a lot of lives, you know, when people see this. Uh, thank, thank you, man, for the opportunity, man. And I enjoyed this um, conversation. We just had. It, it, it was like me just kicking it with one of the fellas, man. You know, it, it wasn't difficult. You shot straight, and we, and we had an honest dialogue, man. And I, pre and I hope your viewers appreciate this interview that we just did, man. Oh, they, they will, man. This is going to be your biggest interview ever. I saw you had a few other little pieces out there. This right here, your, your phone is going to blow up off the hook once this drops. I can absolutely guarantee it. It's all good, man. I, I enjoyed it too, man. No doubt, man. All Until right. next time. Until Peace, man. Peace to you all know? you youngsters too who going to see this, man. And y'all better take heed to yes, some sir. of that advice I just gave y'all. Or y'all going to end up like me, man, doing 28 years in federal prison. Peace, yes, man. Sir. Yes, sir. Learn, learn from other... You know, what they say is those that don't learn their history are sentenced to repeat it. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, man. You know, so so learn l learn this history, you know, from a Bay Area OG. And, and you know, and don't make the same mistakes. And tell them, I want them to understand this, man, when they hear, you know, a lot of these guys rapping, they tell them my story, man, I really lived it, man, you know? So I'm not taking away from the entertainment of being a rapper, but pay homage to the dudes that they were rapping about, man. If they wouldn't, if if my journey hadn't been my journey, they wouldn't be having the content that they were rapping to y'all about and y'all partying to, man. I'm the one that lived it, man, in the flesh, man. It's my story that they're rapping about, man. So I'm saying, man, get dudes they do who didn't earn it, man, and pay homage, you know.